Welcome to this NPTEL course on robotics, basics and advanced concepts. We are looking in these lectures on redundancy in robots and hyperredundant robots and its resolution. In the previous week, I had told you how to use redundancy to avoid obstacles and various techniques to resolve the redundancy. So we looked at uh, pseudo inverse of the Jacobian matrix, a modal solution, and also the tractrix based solution. Okay. In this week, we will look at how the redundancy is resolved in human arms. Okay. Uh, quick acknowledgement this work has been done by Puneet Singh, who a student in the robotics lab and the Center for Neuroscience and Neurosciences in ISC. The funding was by Robert Bosch Center for Cyberphysical System. In this lecture, we have the following contents. We will first introduce, again, redundancy and also look at the redundancy in human arm. We will also look at redundancy resolution by another technique where we use the redundancy to make the velocity distribution isotropic. And then I will show you experiments with human arm and conclusion. So again, very quick introduction to redundancy. A rigid body in 3D space has six degrees of freedom. Two rigid bodies in 3D space connected by a joint will have two into six minus the number of constraints imposed by the joints. The degree of freedom is given by this well-known Grubler's formula. Okay, so for example, in this 3R robot, it has four links, N is four, J is three, and Fi is one plus one plus one, which will give you, and lambda is three, which will give you three degrees of freedom. Okay, what it means is we can position and orient the end effector arbitrarily in a plane. And again, as I have discussed several times now, by now, if you are not interested in the orientation of the last link, if you are only interested in the position of the last link, then we have two equations in three unknowns. And then given x and y, we cannot obtain theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, as there are infinitely many solutions. Okay, so one way to resolve this redundancy, especially for this two degree of freedom case, is we can look at the velocity at the tip of this robot, at the end effector. Okay, so for example, the position vector x and y can be related to the theta 1 and theta 2 for this 2R robot as L1 cos theta 1 plus L2 cos theta 1 plus theta 2 and y is L1 sine theta 1 and L2 sine theta 1 plus theta 2. The velocity can be obtained by taking the derivative of these two equations and reorganizing. So x dot and y dot can be written in terms of minus L1 sine theta 1 minus L2 sine theta 1 plus theta 2 into theta 1 dot minus L2 sine theta 1 plus theta 2 into theta 2 dot. And similarly, y dot will contain now cos theta 1 and cos theta 1 plus theta 2. Okay, so this matrix is the Jacobian matrix which we have seen in the past. So we can derive this G matrix which is J transpose J and this also we have seen in the past and then this is a 2 by 2 matrix and we can find the eigenvalues of this matrix. So these eigenvalues are given by G theta dot minus lambda theta dot equal to 0. So in this case this G is a 2 by 2 matrix and the lambda half into G11 plus G22 plus minus G11 plus G22 whole square minus 4 G11 G22 minus G12 whole square. So this again was shown earlier. So what these eigenvalues tell me is that the maximum and minimum velocity possible at this point, at the tip, at any point in the workspace, okay, is given by square root of lambda 1 and square root of lambda 2. And the tip of the velocity vector traces an ellipse. Okay, so recall this tip of the velocity vector traces an ellipse when there is a constraint on theta 1 dot and theta 2 dot. So we have used theta 1 dot squared plus theta 2 dot squared is equal to 1. If 
theta one dot square plus theta two dot c is equal square is equal to k or k square, then the size of the ellipse is scaled by k, but the shape of the ellipse is same. Okay, so this was done earlier. So now, if I want to make this ellipse a circle, okay. So and suppose I have three joints, okay. So I have now an example where I have three links: theta one, theta two, and theta three. So now the velocity vector at the tip will be a function of theta one dot, theta two dot, and theta three dot. Okay. So at this point, now. we have one redundant joint because i am only interested in x and y we are not interested in the orientation of the last link so i can choose psi 3 theta 3 dot psi 3 is a variable uh, is a vector which comes from the derivative of the x and y with respect to theta 3 okay in terms of psi 1 theta 1 dot and psi 2 theta 2 dot so psi 1 and psi 2 and psi 3 determine the jacobian for this Three degree of three joint case. Okay, so we can compute theta three dot in this manner. Okay, and we force that the Jacobian eigenvalues of this Jacobian are equal. So that will give me a way to compute theta three dot. Okay, so this is a very old paper which appeared in 1988, which showed how to compute theta three dot. in the redundant system in this one degree of freedom uh, redundancy one redundant joint instead of a ellipse we can make it into a circle so the tip of the velocity vector now lies on a circle okay so ellipse means certain directions are easier to go and certain directions are harder to go if you are lying on a ellipse that is what is happening if the velocity vector lies on a circle then all directions are equal okay so this is also termed as isotropic configuration okay so we have done this isotropic configuration for planar 2r but in this case what i am showing you is that if you have one extra joint and if you use theta 3 dot from that extra joint in this form satisfying this equation we can make it look like an ellipse or we can make it look like a circle and the velocity distribution is isotropic okay now let's see what happens in a human arm so the human arm has 7 degrees of freedom okay so if you count the number of joints there is a shoulder joint with a 3 degrees of freedom there is a elbow joint which has 2 degrees of freedom and then there is a wrist joint with another 2 degrees of freedom so there are 7 degrees of freedom we do not this is not counting any of the degrees of freedom at the fingers okay so we do not need 7 degrees of freedom to position and orient an object we know it requires 6 degrees of freedom okay a puma robot or an industrial robot has only 6 joints and it can position and orient the end effector in 3d space in a human arm there are 7 degrees of freedom seven joints okay so question is how do we use this redundancy so this is a question which was asked and it was answered by punith one of the phd student so what we do is we start doing some experiments so the experiment is following okay so there is a human person sitting here he is moving a robot a planar robot okay so the trajectory of the hand is a planar robot okay so he cannot see his hand the motion of the hand is shown as a cursor on the screen okay which is using some optical device it is projected on this tv screen and then from the tv screen it is shown here okay so the quest so the idea is he cannot see his hand but when he moves his hand he can see where is the end point of his hand okay the motion of the hand is planar because this robot is planar we also mount electromagnetic trackers at seven locations on the hand so some in the shoulder some in the elbow some in the wrist and so on since it's a planar motion we can only measure x and y of this point 
So we have X and Y of this something which the fingers are grasping. So I have some degrees of freedom in the shoulder, some degrees of freedom in the uh, elbow and some in the list. So there are four joints which are active when you are moving this object which you are grasping, which is this robot in a plane. Okay. So this X and Y is measured by the robot because the robot can measure the location of the uh, end effector of the robot. And we have these link lengths L1, L2, L3, and L4. So this is the place where you are grasping the object. And there are four angles, which is called as clavicle, shoulder, elbow, and wrist. So these are four thetas which are in play here. Okay. So we can obtain these link lengths L1, L2, L3 for different subjects such that the model, we'll, I'll show you the model very soon, that the location of this point XY based on L1, L2, L3 and L4 matches the position of this X and Y of the robot. So we can play around with this link length for different subjects such that both the XY match. Okay. So that is first step. Then what we do is we do the experiment. The experiment consists of the following tasks. So the subject sees a starting point, which is this white point, and then a green dot, which is the target is projected. Okay, and you are supposed to move the hand towards the green target. Okay, and we do this target in eight random different directions. So First, a target might appear which is at horizontally, then it can suddenly appear at 90 degrees, at an angle 90 degrees, and so on. So, these eight directions are 0, 45, 90, 135, and so on, and 315. So, these targets are appearing. The person starts from one central location and goes to these targets. Okay, and while he is moving, we locate or measure the thetas. We also measure the X and Y, and we can see what is the trajectory of the hand. Okay, so these are called kinematic reaching tasks. So I want to go from one point to another point. I want to reach that place, and then I'm recording what is happening to this uh, during this reaching tasks. Okay, so there is a phase which is called pre-adaptation. So basically, we suddenly show this pick, uh, target and then record. And what you can see is that preaching task is not really exactly straight, but it is more or less following a straight path. So we want to go straight directly to the target. So there is some small deviation. This is basically based on the subject, okay, how he reaches to the task. And you can see that there are a bar or a circle or a square around this target. And if you reach anywhere inside this region, we consider the task as a success. Okay, the person has reached that target. So we can see that there are some small overshoots, but it is not exactly straight. It follows some sort of a slight curve. Okay, so these are the one subject doing this reaching task when a target is shown. The next task after some time, after about some 10 trials, approximately 10 trials in each direction, we switch on the force field in the robot. So what is the force field? Basically, as you are moving towards the target, the robot will apply a perpendicular force. Okay, and the force is proportional to the velocity. Okay, so as you can see, he is trying to move, go from white to this green. There is a force which is acting. Initially, the velocity is small, so the force is very small. As you go towards the middle of the uh, you know, task, your typical velocities are larger. And when you come to the end, you stop or you slow down. So hence the force is also smaller. Okay. So this is what is happening. And this force is applied by a robot. So now again, we record what is happening to the trajectory of the hand. So what you can see is as soon as the force is switched on, which is this yellow curves, you can see a lot of variation. So this bar or the shaded region around is what is happening in the 
first five trials this yellow trajectories are what is happening in the first five trials so there is some variation as you keep on doing this task you learn okay and then you become straighter and this green trajectory shows what happens when you are towards the end of the trials so as you can see that the error is decreasing and the trajectory is towards the direction of the force okay that is important so we are trying to adapt to this externally applied force we learn that there is an externally applied force and then we our trajectories become straighter and straighter it is never exactly straight but it is becoming straighter then after about 200 such reaching tasks okay we switch off this force so when you switch up the force the hand tries to overcompensate it thinks that there is still a force which is acting and it will go in the opposite direction okay so this is what is shown in this last slide here last uh, picture here so now there is no force but you think there is a force so you overcompensate and you go in the opposite direction so as you can see when the force is initially applied that curve is like this and when it is switched off the curve is in the opposite direction okay and in all of these we are recording the xy point we are recording the rotations at the four joints okay and then comes the analysis part okay so first thing is we plot what is the largest error okay so what is the largest error the largest error is when it has the maximum velocity or at some place where you, the distance from this horizontal straight line from the target to the initial point this distance is largest so that is the largest error so we are going to plot this largest error across trials so the initial portion there is no force this is called the pre adaptation period as soon as you apply force the errors become very large so this orange line is uh, along some angle 225 these blues are when you are moving in the zero direction so these are 0 45 all the way till 315 okay so as you can see the errors are very large initially and then slowly the errors go down and we can fit an exponential curve we fit an exponential curve because it is known in neuroscience that the learning is a first order process so if you have some error the next time the error will be smaller it decays exponentially okay and in the post adaptation when the force is switched off again the error is initially very large but it is in the opposite direction and then it again comes to zero so these various dots are the maximum error by a subject in different directions in between 80 and approximately 200 something trials and then the last 100 trials are again when the force is switched off so this shaded area is called the force field adaptation this is post adaptation and this is pre adaptation okay so this is an exponential curve so we can plot it as e to the power minus beta times n here also there is an exponent which is fitted and here also there is an exponent which is fitted okay so now we see what happens for 10 subjects so we do this same experiments with 10 subjects and this dark line shows the average exponential or average error for all the 10 subjects and this here shows the average error for all these 10 subjects in the force field adaptation and this is the average error in the post adaptation this light colored lines are the variation across subjects okay so some subjects the error is much larger in some place and so on okay so this is the data which we have calculated from the actual measurements of the maximum error so now let us look at a model we want to analyze this data so the first thing we analyze we model is this is x and y can be written like a planar robot with four joints okay so in this case we have 
x is l1 cos theta 1 l2 cos theta 2 l3 cos theta 3 and l4 cos theta 4 very similar to the plane r2 r case except now this not theta 1 plus theta 2 why because the actual measurements of the joint are absolute angles okay we can also measure y, which is now in terms of sine, exactly very similar to the planar 2R case, okay, but with four joints. We can calculate the Jacobian matrix, which is delta x by delta theta 1, delta x by delta theta 2, and similarly delta y by delta theta 1, delta y by delta theta 4. Okay, So it's a 2 by 4 matrix. So there are two rows which is x and y corresponding to the velocity along x direction and y direction and four columns because there are four joints. Okay, So we can find out this Jacobian at which place where you have the maximum error. We can also find what is the average error or average theta across subjects. Okay, So average theta and then we can find the difference between the theta between the average and the maximum okay so why do we need this average so basically if i want to go from point a to point b what is the actual trajectory so we assume that when you take the average of all this theta that is what the brain is commanding or that is what the desired theta should be but then there is variation across from this average Okay, so we find out the Jacobian matrix at the average maximum velocity. Then we find the variation theta across the subjects between the average and the maximum. And let's call this delta theta. Okay, we can also find the null space of this Jacobian matrix. Okay. So the null space of this Jacobian matrix will be two dimensional. Why? Because it is a two by four matrix. The null space will be two dimensional. And the null space is what represents the redundancy of this system. OK, so let's look at why. So if you look at the joint space, which is four dimensional, so any point in this joint space maps into some x and y. Okay, so this is given right hand side. I can find out x and y. And this is what it looks like. So I can go to x and y, but I can go to x, x and y in different ways. Okay. So the null space tells you that we can go to this place, but the tip is at the same place. x and y is at the same place, but there is internal motion of the hand. So I can go and touch my nose, but then my elbow can be at different places, even though, and shoulder rotation can be at different places, even though my finger is still touching the nose. So I can reach some point X and Y. However, the theta variables can be different. If you are in the red region, which is not in the null space, if I rotate these theta joints, the tip will move. Okay. so. The null space is where motions of the joint do not cause motions of the tip. So, and that is basically another way of saying that those are the redundant degrees of freedom. Okay. So, if you think about it, what we are saying is I can reach using many, many different ways. And one way to estimate what are these many ways is to compute the null space of the Jacobian matrix. Okay. So the null space is two dimensional. We find the variation of theta from the mean and we project onto the null space. So this is delta theta dot product with the null space dimension and into psi i will give me psi one plus delta theta dot psi two into along psi two will give me the theta, which is the redundant theta. Okay. So that is the theta which does not cause any motion of the tip, but there are internal motions. Okay, so let's repeat once more. I can compute the Jacobian matrix. I can compute the null space of the Jacobian matrix. 
Okay, this is a simple 2 by 4 system. You can easily do it numerically also. We find what is the theta average when you are going from one place to another place and the theta average at the maximum velocity or at the maximum error. And then we see what is the variation of theta for different trajectories about the average. So this average minus theta at kth trial is delta theta k. And we project this delta theta k onto the null space of the Jacobian matrix. And this is a proxy or this is a measure of the redundancy in your own. And then we square this number because we want a single number to plot later on across all the trials. And then this is called as the NJ, which is the null space of the Jacobian matrix. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So once we find what is NJ, we can plot NJ versus the learning rate. Okay, remember the learning rate was the x e to the power minus beta into n. So beta was the exponent for the exponential fit. Okay, so beta is a parameter which tells you how fast you are learning. So if beta is large, okay, then the exponential curve will drop faster and you are learning faster. Your errors are becoming smaller. Okay, so let us plot this null space that you have computed versus this learning rate for different subjects. Okay, so these dots are for one subject, this is for another subject, this is for, so all the blue dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, these are the different subjects. We compute their learning rate, okay, in that force adaptation period, and we also compute the NJ, which is the null space variability. Okay. Likewise, we can also do these experiments for non-dominant hand. Okay. So non-dominant hand for some people is the left hand, but for left-handed people, it is the right hand. So for these 10 subjects, we figured out which one was the left dominant hand and which was the non-dominant hand. And we asked them to do the same experiment with both dominant and non-dominant hand. And again, we collected the data and we find out what is the beta or the learning rate for the dominant hand and the non-dominant hand. So the red dots are the data of learning rate and null space variability with the non-dominant hand. So for example, for one subject, the beta was, let's say, bit around 7.5 into 10 minus 3, and null space was, let's say, 0 0.7. We can plot all these points. And then we can fit a straight line. Okay, we find the best fit straight line for the dominant hand, which is this blue line, and the non yeah, sorry, the non-dominant hand, which is the blue line, and the dominant hand, which is the red line. Okay. So what can we conclude? What we can conclude, we can easily see, is that the dominant hand, the learning rates are larger. Okay, the, num the red curve, red straight line is further to the right. The learning rate is larger. Okay, which, is, which makes sense, right? We learn faster when we are using our dominant hand. More importantly, we can also see that the learning rate is correlated with the null space variability. So for those subjects whose beta is larger, their NJ is also larger. And this is true for both the dominant and non-dominant hand. Both, are, both show a positive correlation with the learn of learning and NJ. And the Mathematically or quantitatively, quantitatively, the, this is shown by the R value. So the R value is 0 0.72 for the dominant hand and the P value is 0 0.018 for the dominant hand. Whereas the R value is 0 0.67, but the P value is a little larger for the non-dominant hand. Nevertheless, 
it shows that there is a positive and significant correlation between the learning rate and the null space of the person. However, we can also find out the learning rate and the task space variability. So this was joint variability. Okay, We can also compute what is the variability from the mean xy of the end point when it reaches. And what you can see is that the end point and the learning rate are not very well correlated. In fact, the R values are very poor and not only that, but the P values are doesn't make sense. Okay, P means what is the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. That if you have a P which is less than 0 0.05, that means the result is not by chance. Whereas if you have a P value much larger than 0 0.05, that it is random. It is a noise, okay, which is by chance. So what it is showing you is that subjects who learn faster, they also have a larger null space or they make use of the null space more effectively. Okay, so whereas if you want to reach a task, then the variability which is at the end is not correlated to the learning rate. Okay, so this is a very important concept or very important finding and this was published in this proceedings of the natural, uh, National Academy of Sciences in USA. It shows that those who use redundancy, they learn faster to adapt to external forces. In this case, the external force was applied when you are trying to reach a certain task or when you want to do a certain task. Let's continue. Now we can also plot what is the error distribution in the first five trials, the last five trials and in the baseline when there was no force. Okay, so in the eight different directions, we can plot the error. So the dark spot is the mean error. The bar shows what is the variation of the error. Okay, and you can see in the first five trials after the force is applied, the errors are much larger. Okay, so the ellipse size of the ellipse is much larger. Whereas as you learned in the last five trials, the size of the ellipse is becoming smaller. It is also becoming somewhat more circular. Okay, so it was shown that the eccentricity of the ellipse, eccentricity is the ratio of the major to the minor axis. Okay, the eccentricity of the ellipse is decreasing as you do trials. Okay, so it is very, very eccentric initially and then slowly it is going towards a circle. It never goes to a circle. One would be a circle, okay, but it is decreasing. The largest error is roughly along 100 degrees. Okay, so if you think of it, your hand is like this. You are going straight, that is 90 degrees. You are going left or right, that is zero or uh, 180 degrees. So the error is largest when you are sort of going towards uh, 100 degrees, okay? Not exactly away from you and not exactly horizontal, somewhere in between, okay? So as I've said, the error ellipse is large when the force is applied and the size decreases with trials. So basically you are learning to adapt to the force. More importantly, the error ellipse becomes less eccentric okay but never a circle okay so remember one of the thing which i showed you that if i have an extra degree of freedom i can make the velocity distribution at a point in the workspace isotropic circular so we were hoping that our human hand is also making the velocity ellipse into a circle so velocity is related to error so whenever you have large velocity, you have larger errors. So we hoped that the velocity ellipse or the error ellipse will become more circular, but that is not true. It is becoming less, less eccentric, but not exactly circular. So in conclusion, we know that a robot needs six degree of freedom for general motion in 3D space. We have seen this many times now. 
many robotic and biological systems have more than six degrees of freedom. So our human arm has seven degrees of freedom. So these are redundant systems. Okay. So in mechanical system, you can use this redundancy to optimize some joint variable or some function, or we can make the velocity distribution isotropic. Okay. In human hand, it is not becoming isotropic, but what is the redundancy being used for? It is clearly seen that the redundancy helps in learning. Okay, those subjects who use redundancy more, they learn faster. The error is not isotropic in the human arm, but it is decreasing okay, with learning. 